From Music for All and presented by Yamaha, welcome to teaching social emotional learning through music. On this episode, the first in our Women Band Director series, Healing, we explore the realities of being a woman band director. We welcome Assistant Professor and Assistant Director of Bands at Rutgers University, Dr. Julia Baumanis. Associate Director of Bands and Director of Athletic Bands at the University of Maryland, Dr. Andrea Brown. Director of Bands at Skyline High School in Longmont, Colorado, Dr. Ingrid Laragoati Martin. And Associate Director of Bands at Gulfport High School in Gulfport, Mississippi, and the Middle School Band Coordinator for the Gulfport School District, Professor D.D. Pitts. And now, our host of Teaching Social Emotional Learning Through Music, Dr. Scott Edgar, and series co-host, Dr. Julia Baumanis. Welcome to our next episode of Teaching Social and Emotional Learning Through Music. In this series, we've decided to take it in a slightly different direction. We realize that there are some stories that need to be told that 60 minutes just isn't enough. And this is going to be our first sub-series. We are so honored to explore the world of women band directors. We have four incredible women who are going to be joining us for three episodes to help us understand the identity, the sense of belonging, and the agency that these four have experienced as they found a space in the profession of band directing. We are so fortunate to have Dr. Julia Baumanis join us as our co-host because I realized early on that this isn't my identity. These aren't the shoes that fit well for me. And Julia has helped us put together this series in a brilliant way. So Dr. Baumanis, thank you so much for all of your work you've done on this, please. Thank you, Scott. Um, I just want to mention, I met Scott not too long ago before we started the series and we started working on the series. We met at Midwest Band and Orchestra Clinic, like you you do with many of these people in our world, uh, through a very good friend, mutual friend, Cameron Jenkins, who has this way of bringing together people and projects and ideas um, to lift forklift everybody up to to uh, steal his term. Uh, and Scott, thank you for having us today to um, allow us to share our stories and to facilitate that on such a wonderful platform as Music for All is. Um, and I'm excited about this series. Uh, it started as one episode. And like you said, it needed to be more than just that. So uh, using the acronym HER, H-E-R, what you're going to hear in this series is three episodes, um, each surrounding one of the letters of that acronym. And the first one being healing and self-identity. Um, we're going to tell our stories. Um, the second episode will be evolution. Talk about how we personally went through some breakthroughs and barriers that uh, were put up against us individually and how we can translate that to anyone else in the field and what we do. And our final episode to be revolution, um, changing what we do and, and really making music for all so that we're no longer the firsts in our field and we're no longer the, the minorities in our field. So happy to be here and, and thanks for having us. Julia, thank you so much. I cannot wait to explore her over these next three episodes. But the majesty of this is that it's just not you and me. We have three other people who are going to be joining us. So please let me take a moment to, enjoy, uh, to introduce to you Dr. Ingrid Laragoidi Martin, Director of Bands at Skyline High School, and Dee Dee Pitts, Band Director at Gulfport High School, and Dr. Andrea Brown, Director of Bands at University of Maryland. Such an honor to have this to be the panel to help us understand the realities. And as Julia said, we have to start with understanding what we bring to the table. From a social and emotional learning perspective, we have to understand our own identity. So we're going to be setting the stage today. We're going to be understanding the reality of the journey, the reality of who we are, so that as we start to explore both evolution and revolution, we understand how our context, our diversity, our spaces that we've brought to the table inform that perspective. So, Julia, I'm going to pass it back to you to please share with us your story. Yeah, I think it's really important in this first episode to understand the lens of which we're all looking through and everybody's story is so incredibly unique um, to themselves. So 
Uh, my story is kind of an unusual one. I never thought I was going to be a band director. In fact, I would bet money on it up until uh, I finished my student teaching semester as an undergraduate music education major that I was not going to be a band director. Um, I'm a daughter of two immigrants, and I've seen uh, both my parents um, come from extreme poverty. Uh, my mother in particular, who's from the Philippine Islands, uh, uh, I've seen her use education as a tool to uh, establish herself uh, financially and have security for her family. So growing up in that household, it was all about financial security, all the work that your parents did to make sure that you never wanted for anything. And that was always in the back of my mind. So the naive young person in me was thinking, ah, band directing, it's not really the moneymaker, so maybe you should go another way. Um, but I was really good at music. Um, I loved it. It was my passion. My parents were supportive of me just being happy. And if that meant going to music school because I got a scholarship and I was happy in that space, they supported it. Um, and it wasn't until I met actually Dr. Ingrid Laragoidi Martin, who's on the call, um, that I started dipping my toes into teaching. She was a high school band director in my area. She invited me to come out and work with her high school drum majors and teach them a little bit about leadership in that position. Um, and from there, it was sort of the bug that bit me, the teaching aspect. Um, when, I, when I found out that that was the thing that filled my cup, allowing, um, leading and allowing students around me to explore music and have those musical light bulb moments, um, I never looked back and I love teaching the future music educator age. So teaching college is where it's at for me. Um, in order to do that, you must get a doctorate. Um, I got that at Florida State University in Tallahassee, Florida, taught in University of Central Missouri in the Midwest for a couple years and then landed the gig at Rutgers um, just last year. So, so far, that's my journey. Um, and I'm never looking back, but it was a unique one. I didn't think this was the farthest place that I'd ever think um, that, I'd, that I'd wind up. Um, so that's a little bit about me. Um, I, I want to hear now, if I could, from Andrea, who is in my area as well. So, Andrea, what's your story? Well, first of all, thank you all um, for uh, letting me be a part of this. It's been uh, fantastic to work with everybody. Um, and I, I will say, I don't know, um, I only the associate director of bands at the University of Maryland. So I want to give props to uh, Dr. Michael Voda, who is the director of bands at the University of Maryland. Wonderful colleague. And, um, but uh, I love hearing everyone's stories. I am uh, from a very small town in um, what I say is the middle of nowhere between Memphis and Nashville, Tennessee. A uh, little tiny town with uh, only a couple of red lights and one high school that with all four grades together were maybe 400 people. Um, and so that's, uh, I, I, uh, parents uh, definitely uh, did wanted their best for uh, my sister and myself, uh, but uh, they need, no one in my family had been to college before. Um, and so uh, I was, uh, didn't really have kind of a clear path of kind of how that was to happen or, you know, but they were really also very supportive of really anything that we dreamt of, you know, that we wanted to do. Um, unlike Julia, I, I got the bug uh, in eighth grade. I knew, um, I didn't know exactly what it was going to look like, but I knew in eighth grade that I wanted to do some kind of music uh, or music teaching. You know, at that time, I, I, I would say I, I thought I wanted to be a band director. That would change a bit as I kind of went through my path. But um, and that had to do with the fact that the uh, high school band was so small that I got invited to march with the high school band in eighth grade uh, because they needed horn players, and so uh, so that was uh, that that was kind of the the hook uh, in my uh, experience at the time. Um, I, I my uh, high school or just the band program in general in my town was very small, uh, but was really supported by my by my band director though was. Um, uh, really supported and encouraged me to uh, continue to grow and, um, uh, and kind of experience new things. Um, I just lived for uh, honor band season and getting to play with a big band and with like so many other horns and getting to experience guest conductors and those kind of things. And so I think all of that really kind of solidified that for me. Um, as uh, kind of talking a bit about that uh, marching band was my, my 
kind of way in for the, the addiction, I guess, if you will, or uh, kind of knowing what I wanted to do. Um, I uh, definitely uh, also uh, was very much attracted to uh, wanting to march drum corps. And so uh, that was a, a part of my uh, journey uh, for the couple of years, my first couple of years of college. Um, and I also, uh, uh, as a horn player, realized that playing another instrument during the summer wasn't always the best for that growth. And so I also took a couple of summers and spent those at Brevard Music Center, kind of being in a total opposite end of the spectrum there. And with all of these experiences, just uh, really trying to kind of grow, uh, not realizing at the time, but it's been so much of a help of just uh, networking in, my, in, my, in, the, in the support system that I continue to have just from even those experiences, you know, so long ago. Um, as I, uh, went through those experiences, I thought for a, lot, a, a while that I wanted to, uh, be a professional horn player or, to, um, be a horn professor. Uh, and so I decided to go into graduate school at first, um, as a, getting a master's in horn performance. Uh, but I realized during that experience and, and through the assistantship that I had, um, which was at the University of North Carolina at Greensboro, my assistantship was actually working in the office and really kind of having a, 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 a wonderful relationship with Dr. John Locke, who was the director of bands at the time. And my experiences with him kind of really kind of brought back into a focus for me that what I really liked the most was uh, in teaching and conducting and working with students in an ensemble environment. And so then that kind of redirected my path into that world. Um, he actually was kind enough and trusted me enough that my very first ensemble that I can claim was mine was the uh, third ensemble at UNCG. And so I do believe that's probably how I got my connection and knew that I was my world was more in the collegiate uh, sphere. Um, I did teach uh, public school for a couple of years, one year middle school, one year high school, was my intention to do that longer, but um, was able to, uh, was um, able to uh, secure a position teaching um, at my undergrad alma mater, uh, and that's kind of continued with my past in the in the collegiate world um, since then. It's kind of been a journey, moved around a lot. Um, I've not uh, had, uh, in the world of collegiate teaching. I definitely haven't had the uh, most direct path, and again, um, not really going to or attending kind of the what I would say is the quote uh, unquote like the the uh, the best schools as far as kind of getting you in the door and going on that pathway and so you know I, I feel like it's 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 really been a journey as, as far as each place and step that I've taken um, by way of um, Georgia Tech University of Michigan and now University of Maryland um, and kind of on the side of that the whole time since 2000 uh, on and off until about uh, 2017, I've been involved with teaching uh, and at the, and with uh, Drum Corps International, very or various organizations. And so, um, again, kind of all of those, uh, the folks that I've met along the way, uh, and again, that uh, has really been kind of how I feel like I've, I've made it to this point. And so um, it's... Uh, Talking about it in that way is like, wow, I've been doing this a really long time, but <laughs> um, I'm grateful to uh, to be in this place and, um, you know, don't really uh, know that this is really the, the last stop. I think that there's probably a few more in the in the way that our business works, but uh, really glad to be where I am at this moment. Thank you, Andrea. Um, if we could go next to uh, Dee Dee Pitts. Well, firstly, thank you all so much for this this auspicious uh, opportunity to be here among these wonderful uh, educators. I came to music um, in a roundabout kind of way, not knowing that this is where I would be. If you had asked my 18-year-old self uh, if this is where you thought you would be, um, I would have definitely said no. This is this was not my path. This was not my journey. Um, I am a proud uh, proud product of uh, of a single parent home. Uh, parents who my mom really fought hard to afford us, uh, my brother and I, every opportunity available. Um, music became the thing for me 
that 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 saw me through some rough times as my parents got divorced and some things, you know, just happening in young adulthood that you just don't you're not you don't ever foresee coming. Uh, and music was that thing for me that got me through the day. Uh, becoming a part of the band. I, my mom was a church musician, uh, so I grew up in the church, uh, singing in the choir and, and just doing all those types of things. But but the, the organization of band got me through some of the roughest times of my life because of the family that was built within those walls. Um, I would... I, when I went to when I went to school every day, it was just a joy for me to get out my instrument and to just play and to know that everything that was happening at that moment was not just about me. It was part of something so much bigger. Um, when I went to school, when I went to college, I was not a music major. I went to college as a pre med biology pre med major. I had dreams of being uh, dreams of being a pediatrician. I wanted to help people. I wanted to I wanted to be the person who was able to show some light uh, in in a in a dark place. But what I found was I found myself in a practice room more often than I found myself in a lab. I was uh, in an ensemble. Uh, I was in four or five ensembles and taking lessons and taking piano on the side and doing all these things. And and I, I asked myself a question. I said, Well. If this is where you're spending most of your time, then why not make this something that, you know, that, that becomes a bigger part of your life? Um, but I just couldn't see myself doing it. I didn't see myself in, in the grand scope of things. I didn't see myself. I didn't see me uh, as an individual. I never saw, you know, a person that looked like me on the podium. I was like, I just don't know. I don't know if I can do this. I don't know if this is for me. Uh, but of course, God had different plans and here I am. Uh, so I began teaching and uh, work in Mississippi. I've worked in Mississippi my entire life. I went to school at Delta State University in Mississippi um, and I began my teaching career. And gosh, it, it was the best thing that I've ever done in my whole life uh, to see students achieve uh, and to see uh, see them be a, a part of something bigger than themselves and come to a realization that they play just a small part in that is something that I will never get enough of feeling. Uh, it is one of the greatest joys of my life. Um, so I went on to to better myself. I wanted to be better. So I got my master's uh, at the American Band College because I said, well, if I'm going to do this, I'm going to do this right. And I'm going to make sure that I know, you know, everything, every part of my craft so that I can be the best that I can be for those kids who look at me and maybe one day say, you know, if she can do it. So can I. Um, so I, I went ahead and I got my master's degree and I, I taught in middle school. I thought that's where my world was. I love middle school students. I love teaching in public education. I love teaching, you know, middle school, high school, whatever age of, of K-12 education you give me, that is, I am at home in the in the walls of those classrooms. Um, I'm a very introverted person, but when you put me in front of a group of kids, I turn, it just turns on for me and things start to happen. Um, so, I now teach at, at Gulfport High School as the associate director of bands. And I will tell you that one of the greatest pleasures that I have is being able to inspire and change lives every single day through music. It is it is um, it is quite uh, it's quite mind blowing to see that just the small impact that I have of standing in front of a group of kids or having a conversation with a group of students uh, that doesn't even relate to music, uh, how that uh, changes and affects their life. Um, one of my good friends uh, says that we are in the business of relationship building. And by gosh, I am, I am so grateful that I get the opportunity to build relationships with students every single day. Um, so I'm currently pursuing my, uh, my, doctoral, my doctoral degree at the William Carey University. Um, I teach a few adjunct classes there uh, as, a, as a professor um, uh, to some of the graduate courses. Um, but I am just, you know, I am just grateful to be here. Um, and I know that wherever I end up, that I will always have a student-centered focus uh, student center focused world. That is, I'm looking to see the best that can be in every single kid, no matter where they come from, no matter how they look, no matter what they think of themselves. Uh, I want to see in them what somebody saw in me. Um, and thank God for a, a supervising teacher who looked like me, who told me that one day, you know what, you can do this. You have it. Um, just go for it. So that's, that's me in a nutshell. That's kind of how I got to where I am. And uh, I'm grateful to be here. You know, Dee, you said that you started out as wanting to be a pediatrician because you really wanted to, you know, change and help individuals. Um, you're doing exactly that. 
Uh, it's just music is now the venue. I think that's amazing. Um, thank you for everything that you do. Um, and last but certainly not least, Dr. Ingrid Laragoidi Martin, what is your story? Hello, thanks so much for uh, having me part of this panel. It's been great getting to know each other. And it's interesting for those many times as we've met, I didn't know any of these stories. So it's uh, we have a lot more in common than we we probably thought before. Um, Didi, I went to college uh, thinking I was going to be a pediatric neurologist. And I was a biology pre-med major for my first three years and worked at a VA or a volunteer at a VA hospital emergency room and worked at a medical research center during my time there. And I played clarinet for fun. <laughs> but um, I'm also a daughter of immigrant parents and uh, had two older siblings who paved the way for me to make it easier to learn English and all those kind of things. So it was a little bit easier road for myself. I grew up in Jersey. And uh, then we moved to Florida and I, you know, started playing clarinet because my cousin had a clarinet, you know, that story. So that's what I did and uh, played piano too for a few years. And it was never my main thing. Like I was a science nerd and I loved it and I still do. Um, and went to high school, had a great director and got into color guard a little bit, got into all the little things, you know, and honor band ness. And um, my senior year in high school, I went to one of those college honor bands and Mallory Thompson was at University of South Florida. And that was the first time I saw a female in that role. Um, and I, I know for sure I never sat there and was like, oh, that's a female. You know, I never associated with me, but it made an impact and she was fabulous and she is fabulous. And so it was the best ensemble I had ever been in. And I thought that was amazing. And I made my college choice to go to USF because she was there, but only secretly. I don't think I knew that. <laughs> I think I just did it. And, you know, I was a biology major and I minored in music while I was at USF and um, enjoyed my time going into the music department. And I, 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 I had a good community at the, at the biology pre-med labs and stuff, but I had a stronger community that I was accustomed to with the music world. And I think it kind of started sucking me in. And um, I started subbing for the Florida Orchestra and I think my junior year, Mallory Thompson's like, hey, let's go to lunch. And, you know, I had just joined SAI and she was a sister and we went to lunch and she's like, what are you doing? <laughs> I'm like, oh, you know, told her my major. She's like, no, what are you doing? Because then I needed somebody to show me what amount of time I was spending doing the music thing. I was teching at a couple of high schools. I was working at the Florida Orchestra. I was, I finished my minor in music and then I'd go and do the science classes. <clears throat> and she's like, I mean, there's nothing wrong with that, but is that what you want to do? And it started kind of pushing me towards being a director, a band director. And I changed my major that summer and um, graduated and did the whole band directing thing. And I loved it, loved it, loved it. Taught in South Florida where I met Julia as a student, <clears throat> and, uh, I taught there for five years. Then I decided that I needed to elevate my conducting and went back to get my master's in conducting while I was there. I was also interested in more music ed and I got a master's in music ed at the same time. And then I went back to teaching high school and had the privilege of opening up a brand new high school, which was a different experience altogether. And that was really cool and neat and loved it. And towards my last few years at that school that I opened, I started going to conducting symposiums and <clears throat> fell in love with conducting and never in my mind that I think I was going to teach college because I loved my high school program and opening a school really was a different kind of community that I hadn't experienced before. And teaching in South Florida, I had a really diverse group of kids and that was really cool. Um, but uh, Alan McMurray asked me some questions. I always needed somebody to ask me questions. <laughs> um, and then I decided to audition and I made it and I went and it was kind of like, I, I tripped over that. That was not kind of in my cards for me personally. And, and then I went to University of Colorado and worked on my DMA. And then when I was leaving, I was planning on going back to high school. And he's like, well, you have to try college for a little bit. So then I did college for five years and I loved it. I, I was able to do the associate director band jobs and I was able to be an interim director of bands for one year. And then um, I went back to doing high school. So <laughs> that's kind of my career in a nutshell. But the, the interesting part of my whole journey, just listening to you all speak and share, is that I, um, I, ne I was never self-driven, oddly enough. I just kind of always needed somebody to say, look at what you're doing. And I think that's an interesting perspective 
for a female minority, just not asking questions and not knowing that, that you're supposed to and that I'm supposed to be in this world and that it's okay. And if I want to be, I can be because I never I never thought it was easier for me to think of myself as a pediatric neurologist than it was to think of myself as a conductor. And even saying the word conductor, I hesitate, you know, because I haven't done all the things and whatever. I don't know what it is that qualifies you to be a conductor still to this day. But um, it, it's been really a wonderful career. And now at this point, at least in the last four or five years of my life, I've done a lot of sitting on committees for DEI and um, diversity, equity, inclusion, and trying to make a bigger impact. So the school that I work in currently is one of the Title I schools, uh, lower income demographic is diverse, and just trying to build a program there and seeing what the needs of the kids are. And it has opened a lot of different mental pathways for me. And in, in that the program doesn't always have to look like what you experience, and it doesn't have to be the world's most amazing high school band. And it has to be a place for these students to belong and to create music. And it, and it's changed a lot of my philosophy. I think I still love conducting and I would love to get in front of a phenomenal ensemble uh, whenever I can. But it also means a lot to me to be part of the journey for these kids and their first time going to see the symphony and the first time seeing Whitten Marsalis and the Lincoln Center Jazz Orchestra and just giving them these experiences and knowing that when we come back to class, it can be part of their culture. And a lot of my students are Mexican and a high population of Mexican, uh, Latino, Latinx population and trying to create a curriculum that reflects who they are and where they came from and what their life journey is. And seeing that there's such a big need for our profession to develop curriculum that allows for those kind of things to happen. And so that's where kind of I'm sitting uh, with all the music ed and conducting. And I don't know where my career is going next, but I sit on a lot of committees to diversify and write curriculum and try to wake up what we're doing in our profession to meet the needs of our students. Scott, maybe this is a, a perfect time because I'm just hearing a lot of things about identity and student-centered um, uh, focus in our teaching. And, and I know a lot of this ties to the overarching umbrella of this webinar, which is SEL. So maybe this is a great time before we move on to the next question to make some of these connections. Absolutely, Julia. Thank you. And thank you all for sharing your stories. I, I'm sitting back here and just soaking it all in. And, you know, Ingrid, when you say that, you know, the more that we feel like we know each other, this is a space for us to come together and actually hear each other's stories. And I don't think we have enough time in our profession to get to know each other in this way. And I think this has been truly enlightening for me. And that's what identity is all about. It's about understanding what are our backgrounds? How does it inform the decisions that we make on a daily basis? There are a couple of ways that we highlight that it can manifest in music education. And the first is in resilience, that I need to know who I am so that I can keep on going one step at a time. That if I'm engaging in any musical process, I'm going to encounter challenge. If I'm looking at a score for the first time, I'm not gonna audiate it perfectly the first time. I might have to work on what my gesture is gonna look like. I'm gonna have to work on it, overcome adversity and work through it. As I'm learning those skills of resilience in music, I'm going to be able to transfer those skills to resilience in life. That's one of those uh, transfer points that we talk about identity and how it can skill build to our work. The other space when we really talk about identity is for us to really understand that music is a mirror of what we bring to the table. It highlights our strengths. It highlights our needs. It's unapologetic. I can't hide from music. And from these ways, we're always looking at the intersection between music and SEL. So what is my self-awareness? Do I understand who I am? And then that's going to lead to an awareness of how do I get along with other people? How do I fit in to the bigger picture? And Julie, I think this is where we're going to head next to understand how our identities 
have really informed how we've worked into this profession, which, as Didi said, was in a space where you didn't see someone who looked like you. So you had to create your own mold and find, luckily, that cooperating teacher was there. Before I go any further, and Julia, hand it back to you, I do want to highlight, because as all four of you were saying, there is a wonderful new movie that just came out that is unbelievable, and it's called The Conductor. If you haven't seen The Conductor, it highlights the story of Mara and Alsop, uh, the uh uh, former maestro of Baltimore. Now she's the artistic director at uh, the Ravinia Festival for the Chicago Symphony Orchestra's summer residence and absolutely talks about everything that is at the heart of our conversation today and moving forward. So we will make sure that that link is put into the liner notes for uh, today's episode. But if you have not yet gone and seen the, the conductor, please put that high on the list. Julia. So, you know, that. thank you for pointing out that film. I know that Ingrid has personally worked with Marin Alsop, which I'm super jealous about, but that's so amazing. I live vicariously through you. Um, and Andrea, I wanted to, to uh, go see the movie in, in the area, but I was, I was traveling. So I myself have not seen it. So I'm, I'm very excited to go and, and uh, check it out. I know that I could stream it on Prime now, something like that. Yeah, so I, like... Now that basketball season is unfortunately done for me, that's going to be one of the things that I'm going to dig into. So thanks for, for bringing that up. Um, you know, our, our question, I think this transfers beautifully. Our, our next question is, how has our identities as women band directors um, impacted our work? Um, and and if I could just speak a little bit as maybe sort of a jumping off point, what I'm hearing in all of our stories is that it didn't perhaps impact us right away, but it certainly has. Um, and it's something that, I mean, look at today, we're, we're here talking about it right on, on this platform together. So um, I, I think that's a common thread uh, in all of our stories. Um, if we could, Ingrid, um, do you want to talk a little bit about how this has impacted your work? Um, sure. It's an interesting question because um, you are who you are. And you don't like live life looking at yourself being like, oh, look at me. I have curly hair and I'm brown and I'm going to school. You know, th these are things that you don't realize, but things that do happen um, in buckets of years. Sorry, I'm not as eloquent speaker. <laughs> um, is that you start to realize what you lose. And I feel like every time I went back to school to educate myself, I was losing a part of my cultural ethnicity, my traditions at home. And it, I, it wasn't until my doctorate that I started realizing that I was, I wasn't being explicitly asked to leave behind my culture, but it was something that was happening to develop into this role of a conductor, the role of a collegiate band director, the role like everybody knows what you have to do and the people you have to talk to and the things you have to be around to become this collegiate conductor, right? A colleague of mine just auditioned for a job and there were 90 applicants and this, they're looking for, you know, a specific something, but everybody's resume and CV looks exactly the same because that's what we do. And I think for me, my identity through all of this was realizing more of who I am and getting back to that person um, not in a reverse order, but in a very uh, aware, um, I wanted to bring back language that I spoke and I wanted to bring back colors and, you know, coming to this, this is uh, personal, but I always, should I have my hair natural or should I straighten it? I mean, it's such a simple question. It's not a big deal, but for me, my whole life, I've never interviewed with curly hair ever. I always have my hair straightened. When I go to Midwest, I always have my hair straightened. It's And nobody ever said that to me. Nobody ever said, Ingrid, you have to straighten your hair. But you do what you see, right? And you see successful people. And so you emulate the successful people. And the success, successful, successful people have straight hair and they dress a certain way and they do a certain thing. And I remember my interview process for New Mexico State University where I worked previously. Um, after I'd been there a couple of months, one of the, I think the saxophone professor came up to me and said, you know, I have to tell you, I was so impressed when you came for your interview because of the way you dressed. And I thought, oh my God, <laughs> what did I do? And she said, no, you were wearing like a dress suit and a color and a colorful jacket and your hair was like curly. And I was, and I didn't like really think about that impacting anybody. And she was a white um, or she is a white person, but like she noticed that. And, and, and those things that we don't know is going to be positive or negative, those microaggressions that show up. So my identity has always been, what is okay? 
what is I'm going to this place with these people. What is okay? The first time I went to a conducting symposium, what am I going to wear? How am I going to look? And it wasn't not whether or not I was going to look professional, it was whether or not I was going to be allow myself to be who I am and look at the way I do naturally. And um, that's been that's been very present for me throughout my entire career. And it's also been highlighted and reflected back to me. Scott, you had mentioned music being a mirror. The profession is. And so kind of fighting through over the years who I am and bringing that person to the podium fully, wholly being that person with everything that I do bring in that. the education, which is, of course, invaluable. And I learn from amazing human beings all the time. I'm very lucky in that. I think we probably all are. Um, but then also being proud enough of myself and proud enough of my parents' heritage and the foods I eat and et cetera, et cetera, to bring that as well with me. And I, I think for identity for me, I, you know, I don't want to talk about individual situations that have happened that ticket tick mark my, my career. But in all of that now, and especially in the last six or seven years, I've realized I can be who I am. And unfortunately, or fortunately, that may or may not help me move in this ladder of whatever in, in, in collegiate music or wind band conducting. Um, but it's something that I am hoping to affect the younger generation with. And that is very present in what I do and that identity um, and being aware that when I show up to school, my kids are calling me Dr. Laragoidi or Dr. LM, not because I need to hear doctor, but because they need to know that a Hispanic lady did get a doctorate and has one and that they can do it. And I came from meager beginnings. And I didn't think that at the beginning, I'm like, I don't care what you call me, but it is important now. And being aware that bringing those kids and exposing those kids to that, I conducted an Allstate a few years ago, pre-pandemic, and had a great time and all was wonderful. I got home and I had all these emails from male and female students that were in the Allstate band that were talking about me being female. While I was there for four days, did I ever think about my womanhood in any way? <laughs> no, I was like, oh my God, we got to make it to this concert and I'm exhausted. But that's what they saw. And so I think owning that for me personally uh, is important and, and, and I need to be more aware of it because like Dee Dee said, inspiring kids and, and, and being part of their journey in a positive way yeah, that's something I always did, but I don't think I had this facet earlier in my career. I don't think I believed that that was important because I didn't know it was, and I didn't have it, and I didn't relate to it. And now I'm very much connected to it, and I see its value, and I think it's something we all need to be aware of from our colleagues that we've known for 20, 30 plus years. So that's that's my piece. Yeah, I, I, we're talking about this stuff now. I mean, Exhibit A, we're on a, a webinar <laughs> That's going to, you know, be talking, but we, I feel like have sort of been tiptoeing around these sort of conversations for a long time. And I, I appreciate that now there are full blown conversations and collaborations surrounding this because that's step one, right? Is, is to tell the story and then to say, no, this really happened and this is how it's impacted my journey. And if that's happened to me, imagine all the people in front of us and what can happen to them based on their identity um, in this in this ensemble music world. So, Andrea, could you tell us how this has impacted your identity, has impacted your work and what you do? Well, I wanted to go back first to just, uh, you were mentioning the, the conductor. And um, one of the things I have to point out is like what a difference of, of that, of her story that I was just so, you know, it, it, everything about seeing that uh, is that you hear her, t you know, talk to so many times. She was literally told, no, you can't do that. Where most of us, our experiences, we do that to ourselves in some kind of subconscious way because we don't see someone else that looks like us doing it or, you know, like there's just there's all these reasons. But especially, I think, as women, we have more susceptibility of hearing the voice in our own head of no and somehow or another, Maestro Alsop, as you know, has people actually telling her no and uh, somehow has the fortitude to kind of push against all of that. So it was very inspiring. So I just say definitely take the, you know, it's like an hour and a half. Check it out. It's, it's pretty impressive. Um, and then with what Ingrid was talking about, I, I know that this is so 
tiny compared to the, uh, all the aspects of, of heritage and, um, and race and uh, all those uh, the difficulties and challenges there. But I will say that Ingrid was talking about losing bits of yourself as you went back through degrees. And um, I've just had somebody do this to me the other day. It happens all the time. When people find out where I'm from, they're like, oh, well, you don't sound like you're from Tennessee. I'm like, well, that's because people assume that you're not very smart if you speak with a Southern accent. And again, I know it is not the same, um, you know, in, in, in many ways, but it is that, you know, it, it's a, it's a, it's a switch. When I go home to see my family, I talk a different way than I do. Um, like I'm talking right now, you know, and it's a bit of, it's just, and it's happened over, you know, it's, it wasn't conscious, but it's just happened over time where, you know, you, it's, it's, you know, again, because of the, the people that are successful, how they talk, um, you know, what you see and what you hear, like, well, I have to be like that. Um, and Ingrid, again, talking about hair, same thing, like just talking about whether to wear your hair down or up when you're conducting. I have had a very, very, very well-respected person in the field say, I really don't understand why you wear your hair down when you conduct. I think it's just, you know, good. And, uh, you, you know, those kind of, uh, things that you're, that, 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 you know, we're finally having conversations about. And I think, you know, being more acceptive of these are superficial kind of things, but I just wanted to mention those as I got it, kind of got into this. But um, I would say as far as identity, um, for me, the way I think I've really kind of made my way into this profession, um, because, again, my uh, my collegiate path wasn't the the the. the what is kind of seen as the most kind of efficient and successful as you might see in the past. And um, that's a whole nother conversation. But, uh, and so the marching arts really was my way in to, uh, eventually kind of being, uh, where, where I am today. And that brings its own sets of challenges because you're typecast in our profession that you're a lesser musician. If you are, um, if you have success in many ways in the marching arts. And so uh, that's been kind of a, uh, something that I've, 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 again, I've felt like I've had to um, lessen, uh, you know, what I, I even, um, you know, successes or, you know, talking about achievements there because I'm afraid of still right now and, you know, to this day, this is not a past thing. This is a now thing of, you know, talking too much about how well things might be going in, in, in that world, because I might not be seen as as serious as a musician, uh, in the other world. And, um, and that, that's something that I'm still trying to work through and kind of how to, 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 and, you know, trying to figure out how real that is, or if that's more kind of imagined on my, on my, um, kind of with, with my, uh, my perception, but, that's how I really kind of learned that I wanted to teach, or, or that's kind of where I'm not really one of the that's not the best way to say it. It's probably where I got my first experiences of teaching at a really, you know, even still when I was like a senior in high school, uh, getting to go to other area high schools, again, very small community and going to help out with their band camps and things like that and realizing that that's what I love. Um, similar to Ingrid as well, like I, and I, I don't think I've, I don't think I ever had a female conductor in any honor band, any uh, area like that. I don't think I ever had one. Um, I was fortunate enough to to know of some, but I never got to sit in an ensemble with any my whole um, educational experience. Um, and I have to say, you know, thanks Sue Samuels for taking a chance on me and hiring me for uh, the staff at Carolina Crown in 2000. And that's kind of what my end was to teaching drum corps. Um, and with teaching drum corps, uh, especially the first decade of teaching drum corps, I was very aware that I was usually the only, I was uh, uh, one of the few females that I would see on brass staffs. Like you would, you know, of course, like the color guard staff, you know, and the, but, um, but it was very rare if I ever saw another female um, uh, on a brass staff. But at this, I, I was aware of that, but at the same time, I was still very much in the mode of, I've got to fit in. I've got to fit in in order to, to stay here. And I think 
in the last, say, 12, 13 years, that shift has changed uh, for me. I've kind of taken more ownership of like, I uh, really wanted to make sure that there was a place for, uh, for more people to do that and that more people, um, you know, to, to make sure that there's, I would see more people like, uh, you know, more females uh, in teaching wherever they wanted to teach, you know, and being okay uh, and with if they, if, they, if they were interested in teaching marching band to not let the pressures of the profession, you know, push them out of that, if that was something that they enjoyed doing. Um, and so, um, and I've definitely uh, had, uh, as, as we all have, you know, you have those, those, those microaggressions and kind of uh, those, those, those little, the, the little tiny cuts, you know, that, that happen um, uh, all the time. And you just, you know, you, it's a bit of stubbornness at some point where you're just like, well, I'm just, I'm, I, this is what I want to do and I'm going to figure out a way to do it. Um, and, uh, but this, I, I had kind of a revelation for, for myself, um, probably around 2015 or so when I had, you know, something kind of personal happened to me. And then I was like, I, that was really what led to, though know, it took a few years to come to fruition, but the, the uh, creation of women rising to the podium, because I've, was really looking for a way for, I, I was just, um, between the experience that I had and just the realization that that's, I just felt like so much we're competing for, with each other or feel like we have to compete with each other for this like one little slice of the pie. And just, and because we didn't, and that led to folks not really knowing each other very well, right? And when you're the other, then you're more inclined to, to have that a tendency to compete with or um, feel that need to, to do that. And so um, that was kind of what led to the creation of that group. And, um, and for me, that's, uh, it's been um, really inspiring just to kind of see folks sharing um, their um, and celebrating and be, and connecting. And I feel like it's, it's made our, our world as women band directors just a, a, little, a little bit more connected. A very rambling journey, but that's kind of where uh, that that question brings up so many, so many thoughts. But but it's all like all of us are like yes, at like absolutely. You know, the the competitiveness, the perceived competitiveness between females. I mean, they have like a freaking name for it in movies. It's called a cat fight. Whereas if there's just like a fight between other characters that aren't two women, it's just a fight. Why are we catty? You know what I mean? It's so I appreciate the work that you do with that group. Um, it's personally, it's, it's a place that I've learned to congratulate myself for doing good things. Cause so often I feel like we're taught to be all right, you know, don't be too much of a look at me and, and be humble, you know, but like, go you secretly whisper, I did it, you know, and have like a birthday cake that's this big because you don't want to make too much of a ruckus, right? And, and why? <laughs> and I, I feel, you know, Andrea, what you're saying about a lot of this, I feel like perhaps this is stuff that I don't know where we learned it or if it was taught or if it's passed down or if there's something, but it's a lot of internal okay, I, I need to be careful. I need to do this. And like Ingrid was saying, nobody told her to straighten her hair, but that's just how we picked it up. You know, I'm sitting here looking at my hair because I straightened it this morning and I have curly hair too. So, you know, it, it's, you know, I, you said you, that you rambled, but it, I don't think it was rambling. I think there are so many truths in what you said. Um, Dee Dee, can you tell us how your identity has impacted your work? Uh, I'll start by saying this. I, I identify with a lot of things that have already been said, um, but I will say that we are a product of our environment. And it's important uh, that we understand that we have the ability to change our environment. Um, I, I born and raised in Mississippi. And if you know anything about Mississippi, you know that we're pretty much the last uh, in, in all things as it pertains to education and uh, just the poverty levels and, and all of these things. But one thing that Mississippi prides itself on is its, it's music heritage. It, we have a very rich um, music background and we, we, we love to support uh, music in all of its, in all of its forms. Um, so when you look at 
a, a conductor or a band director or someone in music in Mississippi, what you will see is more times than not a, a white male leading the charge. Um, growing up, that is something that you that you don't realize it affects you in a way until you're until you're able to look back and say, wow, I never saw I never saw I saw two uh, black teachers, uh, conductors uh, conduct me in my whole high school career. Um, and that's big. That's huge. Um, so when we, we start to look at what society tells us is is normal and what society tells us we can and what we cannot do, you have to look at your environment. Um, I. Uh, I'm a very, very self-conscious person. I've always been that way. I've always looked to see what can I do better. I keep my nose down. I work the hardest that I absolutely can because growing up, I was told as a black woman, you have to be the absolute best that you can be in every single thing you do. You have to make sure that you leave no room for doubt in anybody's mind that you are who you say you are and that you can do what you say you can do. Now, that comes from, you know, family that comes from just, you know, people in my family uh, going through some things and, and trying to help me not fall into any of the traps that they themselves fell into. So when I entered the workforce, my my first reaction to teaching was I'm going to I'm going to work really hard. I'm going to make sure that I do not make a mistake. And if I do make a mistake, I'm going to own it really quickly so that nobody has any any room to say that I am not uh, an upstanding type of person, that I am not a respectable type of person, that, you know, you can't trust her because she she does X, Y and Z. Um, when I look back at how hard I worked over the past 16 years in Mississippi as a director, not for any other reason in my mind other than to say, I want to be the absolute best I can be. Now, the byproduct of that is students who are being the best they can be and, and you know, a band program that is the absolute best it can be. But when you nail it down, when you drill it all the way down to its bedrock, you find an insecurity that is put there because of uh, societal norms and and uh, overcoming these overcome overcoming some of these societal norms is sometimes hard, you know, because as a as a black female uh, band director in Mississippi, the first thing that that you that you might would hear is no, you're you're aggressive or, you know, you 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 have a presence on the podium that is that is scary or, you know, people are scared, you know, people are scared. Uh, and that's just, you know, it's definitely not true because I'm probably one of the nicest people that you will hopefully meet on a, on a conductor's uh, podium. I'm, I'm just I'm super excited all the time and those types of things. But those are the things that you hear. Uh, um, you know, outside of those folks who are your, you know, your friends and, they, and they're telling you, hey, I just want you to know, you know, this is what so this is what so and so is saying. Um, but my direction and my my journey to uh, being where I am and, and doing what I do, um, it's been it's been one where I have really had to learn. Uh, and I think someone mentioned this earlier. I learned at an early age to code switch. Um, and the term code switch is, is very simple. It's, it's you, you are one way in one situation and you are one way in another situation. I learned early on to make other people feel comfortable around me and not being and me not being who I am or who my true self is because I want to make sure that I didn't offend or that I didn't come across in a way that would that would lessen my chance of being effective in the classroom. Um, but what I've learned over these, especially in the last few years, is that my authentic self is is much more enjoyable than the person that I try to be for anybody else. Um, so what I what I try to teach the students uh, every single day, I step in the classroom and it is me saying things to students like you are valuable. You are important just the way you are. Nobody has the right to tell you how you should be. It is up to you to determine how you see yourself. That is not my job. That is not the job of anybody else. I can encourage you. I can be your cheerleader. I can be uh, 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 an ear to listen. But it is up to you, my friends, to decide that you are enough. Um, and that's something that I've come to over the over the last few years of saying, you know what? You are enough. 
I work just like everybody else. Uh, you know, I prepare just as hard and just as much as everyone else. Um, and that in and of itself is enough. Now, do I go the extra mile just because that's who I am and I'm, I'm just that type of person? Of course. But I've learned that, you know, in, in music education in Mississippi is so important that even though I don't I didn't set out to be a, 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 a role model. And I think we, this was in one of our previous conversations that we while we never set out to be role models for people, we end up being that role model because just because of the circumstances that we're in, I think it's so important that. I step on a podium every day in front of a group of high school students and I let them know that it is okay to see yourself outside of yourself. That it's okay to to see yourself in a place that maybe your family can't get you there. Maybe you can't see how you're going to get there. But yes, you can do this. And just the ability to be able to do that because of me recognizing the worth of myself um, is is. It's paramount. It is it is one of the most important things that I've come to uh, in my teaching Uh, and the product of that, man, you can give me all the awards that you want to. I mean, yes, they've come. And and I have to get over the fact sometimes that of thinking that, oh, you just gave me that because I'm a black female and because I'm accomplished. That's why I got that award. I got band director of the year because it was time for you to show that you wanted to to look at diversity in this organization. Um, that That's the only reason that I got that. Or I got to conduct this ensemble or I got to conduct this honor band. You, you, you just wanted to have some diversity on your panel. That's why you picked me. But I have to I had to start to to realize <laughs> that I am worth everything that has been that has come to me now. Th- and that is not a brag. That is not a that is not anything other than to say I've worked my butt off and I have I have put in the time and I have put in the effort and I have asked the questions um, and I have taken the, the advice and sought counsel and, and been hopefully wise in my decision making to the point to where this is the result that comes when you put in hard work. No matter whether you are black, brown, yellow, white, skinny, tall, male or female, when you put in the hard work, this is what the result is. Um, so teaching that to students every single day, the the uh, the opportunity for young girls to look up on look up and see a a black female telling them that this is what you can do. Uh, I mean, it's one of the coolest things. I mean, get little gifts from students that have you know the words "girl boss" on it. You know, because they this is for them. This is huge uh, for for little eighth grade girls who've never seen a, a, a black female be in charge of something. And to and to do it and to do it in a way that's not demeaning and and not berating and just saying, you know, this is how we're going to do it. This is this is how you get to where you're going to get to. I mean, that is so overcoming social norms, understanding that your environment does not have to be the same way since from the time you started to the time you end. And and then understanding that I'm worth uh, I'm worth everything that has come to me through hard work and just preparation. I think my journey uh, to this point, while it hasn't been easy, I'm so grateful for every single obstacle, every single opportunity, because without them, I wouldn't be who I am. So that's, that's it. Didi, I wrote notes. I felt like I went to like a lecture that I wanted to just take notes. And I wrote so many similar experiences. Um, and I appreciate the fact that you said we are we are a product of our environment, but we have the ability to see ourselves outside of ourselves. Um, I, you know, I looked at my background, and one of the things that I always take pride in, and I still do to this day, is that both my parents are immigrants, and both my parents, once they immigrated to this country, joined the U.S. Army. So much of how I was brought up, the discipline, and it wasn't like a. a um, very aggressive, wasn't allowed to do anything. Um, my, my parents were incredibly supportive, but the discipline, the, the, the phrase soldier up was said a lot when we needed to go somewhere and be on time. The phrase was move out, (laughs) um, get in the minivan and move out. Um, but I also, the, the idea of service and serving something bigger beyond yourself was, I think, why I was so drawn to this thing called band. 
um, because you are part of something bigger, something part, you know, a lot of the American band is, is based around military band. So it's a, a lot of the same values. On the other side of that, I found myself still to this day, I have to fight doing things to serve others, to serve others level of comfort, to serve others needs when it's not aligned with the culture or the, the direction that I'm looking at, um, to not upset the waters so that I serve everybody else's comfort level. So molding, and this is a lot about what Andrea was saying, fitting into the, the group that you're a part of. How do you dress when you go to that athletic band symposium? Or when you go to that job interview for the first time and you get to hang out with the band directors afterwards, what are you gonna say? How do you introduce yourself? Do you say doctor or do you not? Is it a first name? Is it a last name? How is that going to be perceived? And a lot of it is perception serving. Um, and I do a lot of code switching because of this. Um, my mother is Filipino, so an Asian culture, and my father is Latvian. So both of these cultures, um, which are almost opposite of each other, uh, my dad was 6'4", blonde hair, blue eyes, and my mom is five something, dark hair, straight, like, and I'm somewhere in between, just mashed together and here I am. Um, but both of those cultures are humble cultures. Um, you say thank you a lot, you apologize a lot, you're quiet. And I don't know if I just didn't get the message, but I was the opposite. From when I was younger, I was the opposite. I was called wild child by my family. I was called the loud mouth. Nobody wanted to babysit me because there was this thing that I would do, which was just like yell at the top of my lungs. And I thought it was hilarious. Um, I was really infatuated with loud sounds from a very young age. And as I went through grad school, as I went through teaching, as I tried to fit into the environment that I was a part of, I started to diminish a lot of those behaviors. And I started to think about the way in which I say words. And I started to think about the way in which um, I change my language. And I started to, to dress a certain way. And you want to talk about how this could be a whole seminar on itself, how you dress on the podium, how you don't dress on the podium. One of my first experiences that made an incredible impact on my line of research that I've done um, was a leader in um, our district for high school band where I taught after MPA, Music Performance Assessment, where you go and you perform with your ensemble in front of adjudicators and they give you some feedback and comments and an overall score. At a meeting, asked everyone in the room, men and women, and of course the, the men were, were much more the majority than the women, um, to write down what they thought women should wear on the podium. And I am a new teacher. I'm, first of all, very excited that there's a woman leader in front of me. And then I was very upset because no longer were people judging how my ensemble sounded or how they performed or any of the musical aspects of anything that happened, but they were judging me from behind and my appearance. And from that minute on, I said, you know what? we got to stop this. This is ridiculous. We have to stop this. So my first research project when I got to grad school was, does what women wear on the podium impact what you hear? And of course, the answer is no. And of course, I have data to back it up. But isn't that ridiculous that that was my first research project? So a lot of this comes from like anger <laughs> for me. And I'm incredibly thankful now that I, I know people like you all on this call um, and that I had Ingrid um, when I was younger. I've never had a female conductor in any ensemble. Uh, Ingrid, I've never played under your baton before, but you'd be the closest thing to it. But still, getting to grad school, getting through grad school, I had fantastic mentors that told me that I was just good and here's how you get better. And none of it was tied to what I'm born as or what I am, per, like visually, biologically, none of it was, was tied to that. Um, and so I feel like I'm very fortunate in, in that case because I've never seen somebody like me other than Ingrid on the podium. Um, but I never felt like that was why I couldn't be what I wanted to be. 
Um, and I think a lot of that has to do with who my mother is. My mother teaches international business and management, and she's a five foot something Filipino woman who runs like CEO company. She consults them and there aren't small Filipino women running that world. Um, and she did it at a time where conversations like this were not happening. And I remember people calling the home phone line and, and saying, oh, is Dr. Baumanis there? And she'd pick up and she was Dr. Baumanis. She's like, speaking. No, no, ma'am, is your husband home? It's like, oh, no, 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 sir. You are, you are very mistaken. So I, I've seen her go through these microaggressions and I've always been observing. Um, and I think that prepared me for when I got to the later years of my grad school and my early couple first years of college teaching these microaggressions, these little cuts, as Andrea puts it. Um, I've been told, Julia, you're really successful because you run your shop like a man. And my loud mouth said, well, if more men ran their shop like me, they'd be successful too. Um, as sort of like a joking, you know, one off, I don't really want to deal with this right now. And it was said to me by a person who I love very, very much and who I still regard as an incredible mentor to me. Um, and then thinking about it that night after it happened, trying to unpack that. And that's what these microaggressions do. They put not only a little cut, but then you have to deal with the trauma that it might kick off afterwards. So my job and my goal, because of all of these identity things that have formed me who I am, the, the daughter of two very opposite immigrants who joined the army. I was born overseas, thrown into this world, had great mentors, but nobody ever a, a woman mentor. Um, my goal now is to make sure that I never, that I never, ever, ever do something that if I can never do something that forms trauma to where one of my students has to Un unwind it later on by themselves um, and that know my worth, just like Didi was saying, know my worth, know that I'm good at what I do, know that you have to have grit no matter who you are to get through this profession. And then when you get there to hold the door open for other people, um, because without the people who have held the door open for me, I would have gotten there, but it would have been a lot harder. And I've been very fortunate to have people hold the door open. You know, if I can jump in, a uh, couple of things everybody said. I'm trying to remember it all, right? Uh, but uh, something about owning yourself, Dee Dee, the, the way you spoke was so confident and so beautiful. It's something that I still have a difficult time doing, no matter what my accomplishments are. And that's a space that I hope that the trauma that whatever, you know, we I, I say little T's and big T's because some things are small, the little cuts, and some have been very epic in my career um, and in my life, like everybody else. And I still can't, I still have an issue with um, calling myself a conductor versus a music educator versus a band director versus, because like Andrea was discussing, you know, the, the marching arts and, you know, you, you live here, you can't conduct here and you can't do this here and, and, and owning the things that you've accomplished in a really positive and uh, even